And we've been looking, this is a very important section in chapter 5. As a matter of fact, for earlier I told you that there are many people in the church history that have called this one of the most important doctrines in the entire Bible. One of the, the foundation of which the Christian faith is, is, is based upon. And so there are a lot of descriptions of this passage. So that's why we're spending a little time to get through it so that we understand and get the full effect of what it is that God is telling us in this passage through the writing of Paul. And this section basically begins in Romans chapter 12 and goes to the end of the chapter, which is verse uh, it's 5, 12 through 21. And so not only is it an important doctrine to the very foundation of our faith, it is also one of the most difficult passages in the Bible to understand because of its structure, because of how it's written. And we talked a little bit about last week. It starts off in verse 12, and he, he says verse 12, and he gets to the end of it, and at the last words there, he says, and all sin, and in most translations there's a little dash. And that's because he goes, oh, okay, let me, let, me, let me explain what that means, all sin. And so he's going to spend two, where we have verses 13 and 14, explaining what he meant by and all sin. And we looked at that first. It's like We call that a parenthesis. In his little parenthesis, he's explaining what he meant by all sin. And what he's talking about is since Adam sinned, and he received the, the consequences of his sin by being judged and condemned to death. Remember, if you eat of the fruit, you will surely die, right? The, the fact that we all die is proof that we're under the same judgment. And people say, well, no, that's because we, we sinned, we broke the law. No, because he covers that. He said all the way from Adam to Moses, everybody died. And they didn't have the law then. So how could they break one of God's laws if they didn't have them? So for centuries, basically, the only law we knew was don't eat the fruit, and then we get the next ones in the Ten Commandments. We have no record of God giving any other law in the meantime, yet all of those people died. And so the fact that everybody kept dying is proof that we fall under the headship of Adam. Whatever he did, we're under his umbrella. And what happened to him, it now flows to all of us. He is our representative. He's the representative of all mankind. And so his action and the punishment he got for his action is applied to all of us because we are under his leadership. He is our head. And since we all come from Adam, all are considered to also have sinned. And so that's what he explains in 13 and 14. And we talked about what it meant to be in Adam last week. In Adam. And that's what he means by that. We are under the headship of Adam. So, he gets to the end of 14. That's the end of the parentheses. And he uses another little phrase. And he uses the phrase that says that Adam was a type of him who was to come. Oh, I've got to explain that. Now he's got to explain that. So now we've got a parentheses to describe that that's at the end of the other parentheses. Is it any wonder why this is hard to understand? It does not flow. And so... Him who was to come. And then he pauses again in verses 15, 16, and 17 to explain what he meant by talking about Adam being a type of him who was to come. So the first parenthesis is to describe basically being in Adam, all sin. And the second parenthesis is to describe what he meant by being in him who is to come. And we understand that is to be in Christ. So basically, in these two parentheses, we have two headships. One is the headship in Adam, and the other is the headship with Christ at the top being in Christ. And so he compares the two in this, that verses 15, 16, and 17. So a little bit, let's look at that. Remember, this is the second parentheses. 15, 16, and 17, chapter 5. Here we go. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose 
from one transgression resulting in condemnation, but on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So the first parentheses, he's kind of saying, well, they're kind of the same. There's two different things. They're very similar. you got two headships. You're either going to fall under this umbrella with Adam as your representative, or you're going to fall under this umbrella with Christ as your representative. Okay, there's, there's only two. When we read that passage last week, it was, it was the, the first man, okay, and the last man, there are no men in between. There's you, one or the other. So the first parentheses is showing how they're, they're, they're the same. They're similar in how we look at them. This second parentheses, he now wants to talk about how they're different. Yeah, they're alike. you got two heads. They're alike in that way, but it is completely different. There is so much to contrast, so much that is different. And so the first one is, what's different about the union we have with Adam and the union we have with Christ? Well, the first thing is that the union with Adam is natural. It's natural because it concerns our physical, natural bodies. Remember, if you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. Or physically, we die. And physically, we are offsprings of Adam. So there's a physical component to that. And we do die physically. It's a natural consequence of being in union with Adam. We're going to, we'll suffer the same fate that he had. As I was thinking about this this week, what if Adam had never sinned? What if Adam had, all he did was the one sin. Okay, he never had another sin. He ate the fruit, okay, and he didn't do any other sin for the rest of his life. And let's just assume, just to be silly, that none of his offsprings ever, 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 all the way down, never, 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 ever, ever sinned. That there's only been one sin ever on this planet. And that was the, the original sin, the one that Adam did. That means old Enosh and Jared and Kenan and Methuselah they'd all still be here. They'd all still be here. And if, this, and if Adam had sinned in something other than what God had told him not to do, let's say he didn't eat the fruit, but he did another sin later, he wouldn't have been condemned to death. Adam would still be here. They, they'd all still be living. Because death would not reign. Death would not be part of the circumstance. It was only that breaking the one that death came in. But if he hadn't done that, but he had committed some other sin... There was no law against him. Maybe he was just selfish. Maybe, maybe he used the Lord's name in vain. Well, that wasn't the law then. Just imagine all of them. So God makes us a, makes a point for us to understand that death does go to everybody. There wouldn't have ever had to been that sin. That's why in Genesis, when we read through Genesis in chapter five, it gives that whole long list. Remember, we studied Genesis of all the ancestors. Out of the godly line, it went from you know Adam to Seth, and went all the way down through Jared and Kenan and through Methuselah. And after every guy's name, and it said, and he died. And this guy lived this long, and he had a child here, and yada yada yada, and he lived it, and he died. God wants to understand and make sure everybody understands that death reigns. And it's part of that natural succession that we have. Death comes naturally. Because we are naturally tied to Adam. But our union with Jesus Christ is not natural. In fact, it's the opposite of that. Naturally, we sin because that's who we are. Our union with Christ is something that has happened supernaturally. Outside of the physical. And it doesn't come because we are a natural physical descendant of the Lord Jesus. It comes because of a gracious, free gift. It's a supernatural thing. That's why it says in verse 15, but the free gift, which is our union with Christ, is not like the trespass. 
One was supernatural, the other one was natural. See the difference between the two? That's why it says, when it says the gift is not like the... It says they're completely two different things. Because left to ourselves, we would be hopelessly confined underneath the, the, the natural headship of Adam, and the only thing waiting us is death. But supernaturally, supernaturally, we get something else. As the Ephesians says, chapter 2, Ephesians. It starts off, says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now he's talking to people who are living. Okay? He's, he's not writing this to dead people. But he said, but you were dead. Well, how could you be living and yet be dead? Because you were under the headship of Adam. And death reigns. So you're as good as gone. You are dead in your trespasses and sin. And then he goes on. If you read down a little further, if I get down, that's in verse 1. If I skip down to 4 and 5, now it talks about the other. Remember, the free gift is much more. It's not like the trespass. In, in the trespass, we're dead. If you scroll down a little bit further, Paul makes this point in Ephesians 4 and 5. But, here's the difference, here's the contrast. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, that even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Or I would even say in Christ, that mystical union, that supernatural union that we have. Because by grace, you have been saved. So the two different things. One was natural and one was not natural. was supernatural. And so there's a big difference between those two. And that was the first thing he wants us to see. The second great difference. Okay, one was, One's natural, one's supernatural. Second great difference. That the one sin of Adam versus the many sins of all of mankind. He wants to point out that there's a difference between that. Verse 16 says that, whoop, lost my place. Verse 16, we're in, still in Romans 5. He says, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. All right, so what's another thing that's greatly different in contrast is one deals with one sin, that was the one sin of Adam, and the other deals with the many transgressions, that of all of humanity. In that example that I talked about, if... if uh, if all we had in mankind's history was the one sin that Adam committed. God said, don't eat it, and he ate it. And even if nobody else in all of history ever sinned other than that one time, Jesus Christ would have still had to come and die on the cross for that one sin. He still would have had to come and be the Savior. Why? Because he, he had to die for that sin because that sin, the penalty of that sin, fell on all of us. And so if it fell on all of us, we would all die because of that one sin. So he had to. But we know that that's not the case. He didn't come and die for that one sin, that one transgression. It says right there, the sin of the one, he's comparing Adam's one sin, is one thing, but so much greater, so much more is what Christ really did. What did he do? What did he do on the cross? What yeah. sin? The one sin? No, no. All, all sin. Who sins? Everybody. Everybody. Matter of fact, say my sin. My sin. There you go. Okay? It's a lot of, when you say that, it has a whole different feeling to it, right? Doesn't really roll off your tongue like yeah. everybody <laughs> sins. And that's why at 16 it says, judgment followed the one sin and brought condemnation. And that's being under Adam. He says, but the gift. One gift, the free gift, the gift of grace, the gift of faith. Remember, it's by faith that you are saved and not by works. But the gift, it says, 
followed many transgressions and brought justification. So he's given us two big contrasts of why they're not this, what, what the great difference is between the two, the two headships. And the, the, the two was, one was a union that was natural versus a union that is supernatural. And one is because one of the unions is based on one sin being covered and, uh, um, and the other is on all sins being covered. So then we have the third great difference. The third great difference. And that's in 17. He gives you one in 15, one in 16, one in 17. Remember, these are all in his second parentheses. 17. Again, compare and contrasting the difference between the two. For if by the transgression of the one, okay, that's Adam, death reigned through the one, okay, death reigned because through Adam, the one man, the one sin, death is reigned to all mankind because we're all in Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. You've got one headship over here, one sin, one condemnation, death reigned, and it went to everybody. So now that's our natural response, it's our natural headship, it's our natural uh, ancestor. Our supernatural comes from Christ, and it's different because He died for everybody's sins, all sins, my sins. I had a big pile. And I'm still adding to them, and he's still covering them. How much greater is that? But he says, here's a great difference between death and life. He says, because of the sin of the one, and talking about Adam, he says, death reigned. What does it mean to reign? And I'm not talking about this. Rule, right, rule, sovereign. Back then, if a king reigned, he had absolute power and control over every single aspect. We think with the mindset of a democracy, and we've got freedoms, and we can do this, and we like to do that. No, that's not how it works when you have a king who is sovereign, because he can control any and every aspect of all that you do, and all that you are allowed to do. And he can make up and change his mind at any point in time. How can he do that? He's sovereign. He rules. He reigns. So it says, death reigned because of the sin of the one. But, because of the work of Christ on the cross, he says that believers will reign in life instead. It's life versus death. But here's the cool thing. He uses the, how much more? So he compared the two. You, you got life in one, you got death in the other one, yada, yada, yada. But when you get to the life part, how much more? As a matter of fact, some of you have the word abundance in your translation. He starts out by saying, and much more, and talking about Christ, the abundance of grace and righteousness. When Christ died on the cross for my sins, our sins, and supernaturally saved us from the natural condemnation because we were in union with Adam. When he did that, he did so much more than that. And that's what he means by he pouring out an abundance of grace and righteousness. An abundance. So he did so much more than just restore us back to where Adam was. Because that could have been the case. If he had just come and died on the cross and said, okay, now... Um, I took away the condemnation because of Adam's sin by which death is reigning. Okay, you're not dying anymore. I fixed it. You're good. He did so much more than that because he did not restore us back to Adam's original righteousness. You know, Adam was a 100% righteous man before he sinned. He was abs He was born without a sin nature. He was a right... I don't know how long he lived before he broke God's law, but he was a righteous man. He had the perfect human righteousness. No other human has ever been able to do that, said Christ. 
But no other human has been able to, to, to come up with their own righteousness. And so Christ, when he died on the cross, he just didn't say, okay, well, fine, I fixed it. Y'all can all have your human righteousness, and it's perfect. Because the Bible says, ah, human righteousness isn't worth anything. It's like filthy rags. So Christ didn't die just so we could have Adam's perfect righteousness back. Christ died on the cross so that we could have His righteousness so much more. An abundance, an overflow of grace and righteousness that could not be achieved by any man. That Adam was far beyond anything that Adam could have ever even conceived of. And so what Christ did is so much greater. So whereas the sins of the one and the condemnation of the one the death that came with the one, how much greater is it what Christ has done when we look at the other side? Being in Christ has moved us not into just another category, but has elevated us far and above anything that Adam could have achieved on his own. So we will reign in life, in eternal life, rather than in death. Because Christ died not only to give us human righteousness, but the free gift of His righteousness, His grace, which made the transfer of His righteousness possible. See how much, see what He means by so much more? How much more? Look at the comparison of the two. He did so much more than just fix our problem of dying. He fixed our problem because we don't have life. And so He gave us His. puts us in a much greater position than Adam. So if you read this, if you skip over those parentheses, now it makes a little more sense since he's explained how they're similar, the two headships are, and how they're different. Because if you go back and read 12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Okay, he wanted to explain that. Let's pretend we just keep on going and pick it up in 18 outside of the two parentheses. So it says, and so death spread to all men because all is sin. And then in 18, he goes on and says, So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. That's the comparison of the two. He just had to stop along the way and explain the two headships and how we fall into one or the other, how they were the same, but how they were also completely different when he's comparing so we'll understand what it is that he's talking about when he's talking about the sins of the one, which basically go to all, and the righteousness that's available to all because it came through the one. For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, that's a capital O, that's Christ, the many will be made righteous. And the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that the, as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Understanding his description of how much more having the righteousness of Christ and how that was achieved is so much greater than anything we could have ever achieved in Adam. Even if he had his perfect righteousness. That's what he's talking about here. The one and the one and how much greater that union we start off and we are all in union with Adam. You can't help it. If you were born, you're with Adam. If you are born again, you have a new head. You are now with and in Christ. <coughs> Let me just point out, I've got another minute or two. Let me just point out one other thing. Where it talks about the disobedience. In, the, in that passage in 19 and he talks about as through one man's disobedience of the many were made sinners even so the obedience of the one many will be made righteousness so disobedience we understand that but Adam 
was disobedient. He, he broke the law. He, God said, don't do it. He did it anyway. All right? In any definition, that's disobedience. But then it's talking about Christ, and it's talking about the obedience of Christ. Now, Christ was obedient in, in two different ways. One was an act, what we call active <clears throat> obedience. And that was that he adhered to the law of God. Remember, he just, I didn't come to, to do away with the law, I came to fulfill it. And he kept saying all the time, the uh, only reason here, my need is to do the will of God. I'll do the will of my Father. That's the only thing I'm going to do. And, and the Bible says that he, he never, he was without sin, uh, Hebrews 4.15 says. And Galatians 4.4 uh, 4 says that, that he was born of a woman and he was born of the law and he was born and yet he he didn't sin. And so he was in the law, he was of the law and he completed and fulfilled the law in every way. Spotless, blameless, he kept the law. That was his active, that's, that, that's what qualified him to do what it was that he would do on the cross. Because you had to be a blameless sacrifice. So active obedience of Christ, that's what qualified him to do what it is that he did. But there's also a, a passive obedience when it talks about the obedience of Christ. This is not what he did, but is what he allowed to happen to him. That he allowed, this is God. This is Almighty God the Creator allowing the sins of the world to be placed on him. It's, it is hard to comprehend that. That he would allow. Wouldn't it have been easier? Christ has said, I'm not doing that. I'll just start over. All right, I created everything with the word. I'll just say a word and it'll be gone and I can start it all over again. All right, one of those big etch sketch things. But he didn't. And he understood by his obedience of allowing that to happen, the consequence of that happening was for the once and only time he would actually be separated from the love of the Father. That the Father who cannot look upon sin, and the Bible says that Christ was made to be sin, that the Father had to... It was the only time that they'd ever been separated and not had a perfect love for each other and perfect communion and fellowship. And this is why Christ cried out if there's any other way. It wasn't the fact that he knew about the physical pain and the torment, but he understood what he was about to allow to happen was he was about to allow the sins to be placed on him and separate him from the Father. And yet, he obeyed. And he allowed that to happen. Knowing what it meant. So the act of obedience of Christ is what qualified him for the role of the Savior keeping the laws his whole life, but it was that one solitary act of passive obedience. Along with that act of disobedience from Adam that he atoned for, along with all the other sins, is how he opened the door for God's grace to be showered down upon us that we might receive his righteousness. Most of what Paul is writing, particularly in chapter 5 to chapter 8, is to get us as Christians, as believers, to have the assurance of our faith and also to bolster us in our faith in knowing how it all happened and why. That we were under this head, but because of Christ, we are now here. And once you're in Christ, there's no way... There's no other place for you to go. If you've been taken out of here and placed over here, there is no other place to go. Your salvation is secure. It is guaranteed. It's finished, he said. It's done. So over and over, he's make, making us to, to understand those that assurance that we have. It'll culminate in the 8th chapter of Romans, which is one of the great chapters in, 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 of assurance. But as we go along, he is building his case and building his case. I think I'm about out of time. I think I'm past time. Anyway, did that help at all in this passage? Yes. Now, if you're like me, you'll get that out tomorrow and read it. You'll go, what? 
What do you say that again? I'm going to get it down. Okay, that's a parenthesis. In your Bible, put a little parenthesis there and then put another little parenthesis yeah. around the other one. Yeah, Understand the first parenthesis is describing how the two unions are alike. The next parenthesis is, is to contrast how they're different. And that might help you as you read it. But just know it's in there to help us to understand the extent of what Christ was willing to do to get us out from underneath the death penalty of Adam and moved into ruling and reigning with Christ in eternal life and how it had to happen. That might help. So it's still said, you still say dead in sin, alive in Christ. So I guess dead in sin had to do with Adam. Yes. But, but if you, before you knew Christ. Christ as your Savior, you were stuck under Adam. Okay. And you're condemned to oh, death. Okay. okay? Right. But, but, but. Duh, <laughs> so much more, the abundance of grace and righteousness, once you have placed your faith in Christ, you now have a new head. Christ is your head. The church is the body. Christ is the head. And you now have this mystical union with Him. Okay? The same way you were unified in Adam, you were now... You picked up, packed up, and moved your luggage over here, over here. and now you are under Christ. You were, okay. you were in Christ, which is so much more than just being under Him, but you're in Christ. I just never thought of being uh, under Adam's control, I guess, whatever you want to call it. Well, under his, of Christ. Under, under his judgment. Under his, yeah, yeah. Instead of Christ. And that's why I said death range. If you're, you're in Adam, guess what? You're, you're going to die. Yeah. And you'll die just like Adam did and everybody else died, uh, has in, since then. Yeah, last week uh, I, I got it. <laughs> Good. Explain it to me. You explain it to me next week. I don't know. Anybody, anybody else? <laughs> so long. Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah. we were all born with original sin from Adam. Was Christ also born with original sin? No. The two people have been born without a sin nature. The first is Adam. Technically, he was created, so he wasn't born, so he didn't come from parents, human parents, which is the, 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 uh, the sin nature passes on. And Christ, if you remember, was born of a woman, but of the Holy Spirit. And so he was not born with the sin nature. That's the first man and the last man. Neither of them was born. But again, we're not condemned because we have a sin nature, but we do. And we're not condemned because we sin, and we do. We're condemned just for the simple fact that we're in Adam. And that means death reigns. Now, coming from Adam, yeah, we will also have the same nature and we'll, we will sin. But, but again, right off the bat, and that's what we talked last week, that's why infants die. Well, they didn't have, uh, didn't sin. That's why um, uh, aborted babies, they experienced death. Um, did they sin? What did they do? So again, it has to do, if you're in the human race, you're under Adam. You're in Adam. And that's where a lot of religions get wrong. Yeah. Uh, 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 they, they, don't, they don't believe that Mary was a virgin. They don't. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit conception. Right. There's a lot of them like that. So they, they don't believe that God broke that. That's why He broke it right there. Right. He had her conceived, not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit, by His. Spirit. If Mary had conceived by another man, then the sin nature of that couple would have passed, that father, okay, would have passed on to, to the baby Jesus. And he would have had a sin nature just like all the rest of mankind. And if he had a sin nature, that would have been enough to condemn him. That's why it had to be a virgin birth. That's why it had to be a virgin birth. And Isaiah told you it was going to be a virgin birth. That's why those religions believe that we can rise to the level of Jesus because he was just a super good man. Right. And even Jesus is working his way up the holy calendar. One day he will transplant and take over God's position and we can work our way up. One of us one day might be like a Jesus. You know, and we can all go and then God the Father, he's moving up to some... Yeah. Don't have to worry about it being me. <laughs> 
change it into an afternoon. <laughs> 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 that's why I'm very on the keys, too, in her segment, because she had this in there. That's right. Her. She was under Adam as well. Yep. yep. And in her little, uh, Mary's little song she sang, she praised Jesus as her Savior. Well, it's because the angel told her what was about it, who he was. And she knew she needed a Savior. That's what gets you back to other religions that say so many Hail Marys and stuff. Mary needs salvation just like we did. Well, she can't do I'm going to tell you what, you, you can call her in her name all you want, but she's dead. She's dead. And Paul is dead. And John and Peter and Matthew, they're all dead. None of them can help you. There's only one who is alive. And it's Jesus Christ. Pray to Him. In Him is life. Not Mary. Mary was condemned under Adam. She died. Anybody else? Lord, we thank you for tonight, and Lord, we ask that you'd watch over us as we travel home and keep us safe, and bring us back again here on Sunday. Lord, we thank you for the time of fellowship, and also the, the enlightening. Lord, just I thank you that you just get us thinking about all that you have done, and who you are, and the great work of salvation that we all enjoy. So Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for our time together. Keep us safe. Draw us ever closer. Amen. Amen.